Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis and today I'm talking with Doug, our favorite ICU doc, and Justin, our comic relief. Uh, how are you guys doing? Awesome. Thanks, Dennis. <laughs> well, and you? <laughs> I'm always doing good. Now, the um, reason I really wanted you guys on is because you all you just got done doing a, a sepsis CPG for prolonged field care. And uh, I really think we should uh, walk through this and uh, talk about some of the finer points. Uh, I guess starting off, now, why, why did you, why do you guys want, why did you want to do a, a sepsis CPG, you know, specific for the austere environment? I know, I know this one kind of came from working with Dr. Keenan and Dr. Shackelford on the wound care CPG. And if uh, the protocols within that CPG failed or somebody had progressed into a pretty bad state uh, in terms of their wound, what was going to be the next step? And maybe the worst case scenario is sepsis. So we, we wanted to try to come up with some sort of solution for that. I think that was the initial premise for developing this. So, I mean, is this something that's, you know, very likely to happen in the prolonged field care or, you know, is this just uh, us nerding out? I, I don't know. I've seen a couple of septic patients. They were all indigenous personnel. And to be honest, looking back on it, I'm not entirely sure at the time I knew they were septic. But now after having dug into this and looking back on it, yeah, they were, they were pretty sick, sick patients. And I wish I'd had something along these lines that I could uh, that I could use to manage them. But pretty much just threw antibiotics and antimalarials at them. And it was it was a little bit haphazard. And I wish I'd have had a goal, something that was a little bit more by the book protocol to take care of them better. Hey, Doug. Uh, so when it comes to, to sepsis, like what are the, like, the really important points just to kind of frame our, our talk here? Um, well, one overarching point and, and to answer this, this sort of speaks to your question of, you know, why, why sepsis, why sepsis CPG and fall on field care? is that um, even though, you know, we are in a line of work that um, is very trauma-centric, um, distributive shock due to sepsis is actually by far and away the most common cause of shock in, in the world, in all comers. It's far more common to be um, super sick because you're infected um, than super unstable because you're wounded um, by, you know, a ratio of at least like two-thirds to one-third or two-thirds to 20 percent. So, um, you know, we may not see that much of it because of, again, our line of work, um, but it's just around the corner. And anybody who's deployed to, you know, West Africa uh, during the Ebola crisis uh, or anywhere in the world now um, with COVID-19 out there, you know, knows that the far greater risk to um, life and limb is, is really infection and not, um, and not injury. Um, as far as like, if I were to say, you know, no one thing about sepsis that in, 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 you know, know it cold and absolutely never forget it and do it all the time and you'll have the best possible results. It's, um, early and early recognition and antibiotics. Like you can forget all the other stuff. You can even, you know, I, you, if people are going to strike me down for saying this, you know, Forget about resuscitation, um, but you know, in all of the studies uh, that have looked at outcomes in sepsis, a failure to provide timely um, broad-spectrum antibiotics is associated with a mortality risk, and no real studies have shown a mortality risk from various resuscitation strategies. That's not to say don't resuscitate, but if you're going to do one thing for your septic patient right away, give them the antibiotics. Don't mess around with the fluid and then give them the fluid mm -hmm. unless they're super unstable, in which case, uh, in, in which case you may have to give them fluid and antibiotic. But that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. I think, you know, and, and CPG kind of lays it out. It's just early recognition, I think is probably the key, um, to, you know, really treating anything is just recognize that, re recognizing that it's taking place. 
So other yeah, than just anybody, looking at somebody that and saying, hey, um, this person is sick, um, you know, how, how can I kind of quantify it to lead me towards this person is he's not just a pneumonia patient or they're not just a malaria patient, but they're also a septic patient. Like, how do I um, differentiate that? So sepsis is, is um, an infection with any, um, any type of end organ dysfunction. Right, so altered mental status, confused, lethargic, and infected, you're septic. Um, you know, decreased urine output, um, you're septic. Um, you know, uh, nauseous because you're not perfusing your gut and uh, anorexic and you don't want to eat, you're potentially septic. So mostly we'll see, mostly we'll see, um, you know, severe infection with altered mental status. That's, that's probably the most common um, initial presentation of, of a septic patient. Okay. They're confused. They're lethargic. Um, you know, yeah, they're, they're, they're not themselves. Right. Um, so in the CPG, they, re- they lay out like uh, the Q sofa and uh, a news, news, news two score. Um, other than just, you know, like your kind of clinical, like your gestalt of just looking at somebody and saying, Hey, they, they're not acting right. Um, is there, is there value in using these Q sofa or these new scores or should you just go with kind of your gut on what you see? Uh, I mean, they can add some data. New, news two is, is not well known at all. And in fact, if you ask, ask me to define off the cuff, the components of the news two score, I would say, you know, can I Google that? Because I, I don't know. Um, Q sofa, uh, I've had problems with, and many of my critical care colleagues have had problems with that came out, uh, cause I think it leaves a lot of sepsis off the table. It's very specific, uh, but it's uh, not very sensitive. Um, and, um, it's very specific because one of its factors, right? Low blood pressure, uh, we all know to be a late sign of any shock state, right? The body is going to defend its blood pressure pretty much until the very end. And, you know, whether you're teaching people, you know, hypovolemic shock and hemorrhage or distributive shock and sepsis or cardiogenic shock, um, you know, you're always going to tell your class and your students, hey, blood pressure is a late sign. And if you wait until the blood pressure falls, unless the patient comes in hypotensive, but if you wait until the blood pressure falls, you've missed it and you're behind the curve. So, you know, I, and again, a bunch of my colleagues and, you know, not a small minority in critical care medicine still think thirst criteria has a lot of validity. Um, number one is because it catches those, you know, at an early state, blood pressure has no role in it. Um, febrile, tachycardic, tachypnic, you know, the, those are easily observed signs at the bedside that should, you know, should um, complement your gestalt that, hey, this patient doesn't look right. Uh, and, and as they get worse and they more tachycardic and more tachypnic, they should look not righter or more not right. Um, and, you know, white blood count, okay, leave that out. But, even, you know, the, the paper that, that established THERS as a criteria for diagnosis of sepsis back in 1991 said, hey, you know, if you have two or more positive categories and an infected patient, they're septic. That was the initial definition of sepsis. And I think that still has validity, especially in prolonged field care where we don't just don't have a lot of kit. Yeah, absolutely. yeah I know when we were developing this, uh, one, one of the debates that we had back and forth was uh, I, I don't have a lot of clinical discretion in terms of septic patients. I just don't have it because I don't have the experience as a medic. So we were looking for something that was very quantifiable that could give us a I, I don't know, I, I guess the best whole patient outlook as to how they were presenting. And so that's why the SERS is in there, QSOFA, and then the news too found its way in there very much towards the end. But without clinical discretion, there, there needed to be something, I guess, quantifiable, whereas I could look at a patient as a medic who doesn't see this every day and not not immediately identify them as being sick, but have some vital signs that I could take a look at and say, okay, well, Maybe this guy is in trouble. Yeah, you know, Greg, you know, Colonel Greg Riff, a, a friend, a good friend of mine. Um, you know, early, uh, who's I've been involved with since early on in my prolonged field care career, said, you know, somebody 
you know, on a drop zone uh, after finishing, you know, kind of a hairy jump on a hot day is probably going to be two or three search criteria positive. And, and, you know, he makes a good point, but the point is it is context, right? So you have this patient that you're concerned something is wrong with. Well, then what are you concerned about? You know, are they bleeding out or are they infected or, you know, much less commonly, there's something wrong with their heart. And I think we can probably leave cardiogenic shock off the table for almost all of our prolonged field care discussions. But, you know, let's say, so is he bleeding out? No. Well, then what's wrong with him? Is he dehydrated? You know, does he have an environmental injury, heat injury? Yes or no. Um, well, then is, is he infected? And if he's in, if you suspect that he or she is infected, and then you apply the search criteria, which is the way it was meant to be done, not just, you know, walking down the street or, you know, hall and drop zone, um, then it's pretty helpful. And, you know, if a medic called me on a telemed line and said, hey, doc, I'm in, you know, I'm in the continent of Africa and we're in a, in a, in a um, falciparum resistant uh, endemic malaria area. And I have a patient who, um, you know, looks really sick and is three search criteria positive. I'll be like, ooh, that gets my attention. That's interesting, Doug. That's good stuff, man, for the SERS criteria, because I didn't know which one, when we were writing this, which one maybe had more emphasis or was something you should look at closer versus the other one. So other than, you know, um, assessments, um, or I guess there's part of your assessments, um, they they label uh, monitoring lactate as, as one of the um, tools to use. Um, mm-hmm. You know, recently they're talking, they're talking about, you know, using cap refill is as good as a, as a lactate. Um, but cap refill wasn't on, at least in that section of the, of the CPG. Um, if can you, uh, kind of walk us through, um, one, you know, why is lack monitoring lactate, you know, uh, important or not important. And, um, you know, is, is this cap refill, is this something that we really should be doing? You know, you know, lactate monitoring is, is, is you know, lactate in the blood is, is generally thought to be a sign of anaerobic metabolism, right? And so that means that not enough oxygen is getting to uh, tissues that require oxygen. And so they're having to um, provide their own fuel with anaerobic metabolism rather than, you know, the, the Krebs cycle, ox- oxygenated um, phosphorylation uh, of ATP. And so, um, you know, re- regard- regardless of whatever reason you're in shock, uh, if you're in shock enough and long enough, um, your lactic acid can be elevated. And sepsis is no different from hypovolemic slash hemorrhagic or, or any other shock state. Mm-hmm. But, you know, applied to sepsis, you know, let's say, you know, you do have an elevated lactate and it is being, you know, touted as a performance measure in, in clinical medicine as well. Um, it's just bloody hard to get a lactate monitor in the field, right? Right. Um, then you, it's just more data to add to the recipe. It's just another ingredient to add to the recipe of the dish of sepsis that you're trying to cook, mm-hmm. sepsis management that you're trying to cook, right? If you try to cook a dish, any dish with, you know, one ingredient, it's going to taste like that ingredient. If you try to cook it with a bunch of ingredients, you're going to get something that tastes better. So if you try to assess a septic patient, you know, with the first criteria, with QSOFO, with the news criteria, with the clinical judgment, with signs of end organ perfusion, like mental status and urine output and, you know, uh, and a lactate. Well, then if all of those needles are moving in the same direction, you can feel either worse that your patient's getting worse or better that your patient, you know, is responding to what you're doing. Right. You know, I, I once heard a talk given by a fellow at University of Michigan, you know, it's called Markers of Resuscitation. And the second slide in big, bold yellow letters on a black background that there are no markers of resuscitation. And, and I think that's the best point. That's the best way I've ever seen it phrase there there are no single markers of resuscitation there's a composite picture and the more more ingredients you can add to that composite that move in the right direction the better you can feel uh, or or worse if they're getting worse right no, that's 
Yeah, that's really interesting. And I will say that uh, when Dr. Keenan and I started this thing, we started off with a very much a whole patient approach. And we tried to mm-hmm. look at it from both my perspective as well as the either receiving doctor or the telemed doctor in terms of what information was important. Because to be honest, lactate, what does that mean to me? I don't know. I guess it should be under two, I guess. But I don't really know what that means to me. But but I bet it means a lot to a telemed doctor or it means something more to me. And so we really did try to take it from this whole patient approach, try to gather as much information as we can and understand that telemedicine is probably going to be something that needs to happen very, very quickly. And as much information as we can convey to that to that doctor on the other end it it'll probably only help the patient more and i think lactate was an important component that everybody decided decided on yeah because i mean you know i think at least from talking to people you know lactate like last year was like the new hotness and now Mm -hmm. it's kind of fallen out of favor and now it's cap refill you know I, i definitely agree with you doug that it's there's never one sign or one monitor or one number that you really want to guide everything off of. It's just that composite picture looking at the the entire patient and uh, see if uh, everything's pointing in the same direction. That probably is the problem. Um, but if you are just uh, tailoring it off of one, you know, you could be, you could be going in the opposite direction or you could be tr- just tricking yourself. Um, the only I guess real question I had with the lactate is, you know, it it is known that, you know, with anaerobic metabolism, lactate can go up, Mm -hmm. but with a lot of other things can also change your lactate levels, you know, like the patients in pain, um, you know, their sympathetic response, things like that, uh, medications Mm -hmm. that take away that sympathetic response. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm just, I guess I'm kind of confused on if I'm using that, that clearance of that or the reduction in that number, um, you know, how well is that, is that going to guide me versus, you know, the urine output or mental status or these other things that aren't necessarily confounded, I guess, as badly. I don't know if that makes sense. Right. Well, I'll I'll go back to, you know, the whole picture, the whole patient approach or the Uh recipe, right? Because, certain elements of, uh, you know, certain markers of resuscitation or certain things that we use as ingredients to assess resuscitation or assess the need for resuscitation because they're really just opposite signs of the same coin, right? If they're getting worse, you need to resuscitate it. If they're getting better, then, you know, your resuscitation is going all right. But certain elements of, you know, resuscitation um, can be confounded. And lactate is very, is notorious for that, right? If you have an acute liver injury for whatever reason, you know, lactate is um, cleared through the liver to a large extent and can be built up for that. Epinephrine alone can cause, you know, well-known lactic acidosis. We see it in cardiac surgery patients all the time because a lot of times they come out of the OR um, needing some epinephrine support to not only improve their blood pressure, but improve their cardiac output when they come off a bypass. And we get patients, you know, who come out who are not, and not in shock, but their lactate levels are, you know, seven, eight, nine and rising. You know, that would that would put most people's, you know, that would get most people's panties in, in a wad pretty quick if, if they called up or, or they had a patient and they're like, oh, I got my fancy, you know, finger stick, you know, portable TFC approved lactate monitor and my patient looks well, but it's lactate's nine, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, again, the more data points you have, um, the more um, comfortable you can feel in the general trend, and if you have an outlier, then I think that you look. Then you look to explain the outlier. You don't follow the outlier. If that makes sense, right? Right. If I've got ten things telling me that my septic patient is getting better and lactate is rising, you know, then I have to then I have to expl- find an explanation for why the lactate's rising that does not that that that's different from their shock state is worsening. Because I've got all these other things that are clearly telling me the shock state's getting better. To include cap refill, and I like cap refill. I think that's a super handy new, it's not new, but it's a sort of newly dis, newly rediscovered addition to the armamentarium of, of, of um, assessment. Uh, just moving on to the next section. So 
just uh, as part of find actually finding not only just early recognition, but actually trying to find where the source of infection is. Mm-hmm. Um, it goes through, you know, your subjective assessments, uh, patient history, et cetera, you know, objective assessment. And they mention indwelling catheters being IV, IO, or uh, urinary catheters. And mm-hmm. if you've placed them in a less than sterile uh, environment, um, that can be your source of infection. Uh, mm-hmm. My question is, since we know, I mean, we're going to be in a less than sterile uh, area environment, and usually mm-hmm. when we do put these in, there we're under we're under we're under the gun, right? Mm-hmm. Or it could be. Um, should we, when we get to a place of more safety where you have more time, should we almost prophylactically be exchanging out catheters, just assuming that this is dirty? I'm going to replace it with a um, a more clean um, catheter. Yeah. 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 The short answer is yes. Probably the long answer is yes. So I'll give you a longer answer anyway. But um, but that you know that we do that in the hospital. Uh, we have catheters that are put in in a code situation or pre-hospital by EMS when they come in and. The first thing is is to assess. Well, do we still do we still need the catheter? And usually the answer is yes. But you always ask that question first because the best thing is just if you don't need it, take it out and don't don't replace it. But nine times out of ten, you're you're going to need it. It was put in for a reason. The patient's still unstable. You're going to need it. And so then yes, uh, if it was put in in, in dirty environment, then uh, take it out and put it in in, in a more sterile environment. Right. I'm I'm curious, sir. How many uh, cases of sepsis have you seen that are potentially a result of I don't know some iatrogenic thing like a catheter, a Foley, something along oh, those lines? Hundreds. Yeah, Foley. Yeah, you know, know, Foley okay. catheter sepsis. Uh, central line. It's 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 rare to the point of being almost non-existent that you see it from a peripheral IV or an IO. It's not to say it doesn't happen, but the risk is so, so much lower, which is, you know, one of the reasons that honestly in a field environment, uh, IOs and a well put and a good IV are, are really preferable to central lines because, you know, they deliver fluid pretty much just as well and meds just as, as well. Um, and they come with, without all the risks of central lines. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know, hundreds of cases of, of urosepsis and, and, um, and, um, ventilator associated pneumonia and um central line associated infections yeah that's yeah, we're getting to highlight the the importance of us doing this properly when you know so many times I, I think we do catheterization of anything pretty cavalierly sometimes yeah perhaps we shouldn't yeah i mean yeah we've all we're seen getting where where the guys i don't have time to clean it or, i don't have time to put gloves on or or something like that, like you definitely have time because if you don't, you know, that's just going to be more resource intensive just because you're, right. you're going to have to replace it. Right. Yeah. You know, an old, uh, a, a, a good friend of mine, it, it, it was a sergeant major with, um, with a special operations unit, uh, now retired, you know, I think said it best. He said, you know, the best field medicine is clinical medicine applied as closely possible to clinical standards. And we improvise because we have to, not because we can. Um, and I would, th- I would say that, you know, the reasons for doing any type of catheter or device insertion under, under unclean circumstances are, you know, either your patient is dying in front of your eyes and you absolutely have to get you know, some resuscitation fluid or blood going because their blood pressure is like 40 over 20 Um, or you're being shot at. Um, And if neither of those conditions apply, then, you know, clean the area, put your damn gloves on and do the best, do the best you can with what you have. Um, Now I will say that device related infections, you know, take a little bit of time after the device goes in. It's not like I'm going to put in a, central line and five hours later, they're going to be septic. You know, you've got a little bit of time. Um, so, if, you know, if that patient's blood pressure really was 80 over 40 and you really did have to get, you know, six units of whole blood in, in to stabilize them and then they moved, um, 
you know, I would just sign off like, hey, this catheter is put in under unclean circumstances when they get to their next destination. You know, replace it, replace their central line or replace their ID. Very good. You know, we've we've suspected it. We believe that we've found whatever source it is, um, mm-hmm. either iatrogenic or the wound or whatever. Um, now it comes down to this patient is hypotensive and we need to do some kind of fluid resuscitation. You know, like we were talking about earlier, uh, you know, it's very common where people, at least they're talking about vasopressors early. Um, you had mentioned, I think it, maybe it's a better way to say it is vasopressors concurrently with fluids, but usually they're only talking about the vasopressors. Um, why, why are fluids first and not vasopressors, just to get that part out of the way? Well, fluids are first instead of vasopressors for a couple different reasons. I mean, number one is it's easy, it's easy to get an IV in and start fluids than it is to, you know, mix vasopressors or figure out how to dose them, right? I mean, even in the hospital, it takes us a minute, or, you know, to get vasopressors going. And we generally have bolus bags of fluid lying all over the place. Secondly, if you look at the physiology of, like I said, all of the shock states that we really treat in prolonged field care, which are, which are either going to be hypovolemic or distributive, you know, fluid is a necessary first step, right? Either the pipes are empty because, you know, you've lost a lot of blood or you're dehydrated. Not only could you lost a lot of blood, but if it's a bowl, it's dehydrated attack um, from diarrheal and, and vomiting. Um, or the the container that holds all the fluid has all of a sudden increased in size by 30% and the pressure head is down because of that. And so you've got, you know, eight liters of fluid filling an eight liter container. Well, now the container is you know, 11 or 12 liters and it's still only got eight liters in it. You know, you've got to top up that, you've got to top up that, that bigger vessel. Mm-hmm. So that's why fluids are first line. Okay. Um, so the way the, the recommendation goes for fluid resuscitation is up to 30, is it 30 mLs per kilogram uh, within three hours. So, mm-hmm. you know, the math, the math I think is fine. Um, but how fast are you pushing this fluid? Because I've definitely heard people talking about, you know, dripping this in, this volume of fluid in over three hours. I've also heard people talk about just pressure infusing it in. Uh, very rapidly. So, you know, I guess how fast are you pushing a a bolus of whatever amount of fluid? Well, so if your patient is in, <clears throat> is in shock and you're trying to have a hemodynamic effect from fluid resuscitation, it should be given as a bolus okay. um, because um, it should be given as a bolus. Um, the 30 cc's per kilogram, I will reiterate, is a recommendation for sort of the maximum initial resuscitation. Mm-hmm. It is not a goal. Right. It's not, you know, and we see this in burn. You know, as I tell students and audiences when I talk about burns, is like the reason we have 10 different or however many different formulas for burn fluid resuscitation is that everybody takes the latest formula and over resuscitates with it because they see it as a goal, not, and not as a guideline. Right. Right. And so 30 cc's per kilogram came out of civilian sepsis guidelines developed by the surviving sepsis committee. They're 30% higher than the recommended initial fluid resuscitation guidelines for any other shock state to include burn, which is burn and burn and, um, and uh, hemorrhagic shock or you yeah, know, 20 cc per kilogram. Shock, yeah. You know, or 20 cc per kilogram. And so take them with a grain of salt. And for God's sake, don't use them as a, um, as a, as, as a target, just as a recommendation. If you give your patient, a, you know, two liters of fluid and they're not doing anything, uh, you know, blood pressure isn't coming up, urine output isn't increasing, mass status isn't increasing, well, then maybe you ought to start a presser. Or at least assess whether they need that third third liter with some objective measure, you know, being that a straight leg raise or an ultrasound visualization of the of the left ventricle or the IDC. 
Man, that makes that makes me happy to hear you say that, Doug. So often we treat the patients with some sort of formula, like I have to get this amount of fluid into them. But really, that's right. That's not the goal. The goal is 0.3 to 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour urine output, not just flooding him with 30 milliliters per kilogram of IV fluids. Right. Yeah, 100 percent. Or. You know, mental status is better. The guy now knows his name, or the, the, the guy or the gal now knows his, his or her name, knows where they are, um, you know, is following commands, and maybe, the, you know, maybe they still don't have great urine output. And we were going to, I know we're going to talk about kidney stuff, you know, probably next in the next podcast um, in more detail. But, you know, there are all sorts of reasons that the kidney can be injured in any shock state, and only some of them are going to respond to fluid. Some of them will not. Yeah, and so if you're again, flood the hell out of their system with fluids, you should, you should probably check their lungs, I guess, every once in a while. Right, 100%. You know, the, you know, the kidneys are pretty resilient, and um, and you can do with depressed renal out, out uh, renal function for a reasonable amount of time. And so, you know, is it really worth it to put, you know, six liters of fluid into some of you to get them to pee? And then, you know, you've got to intubate them because they're in respiratory failure for pulmonary edema, um, which is introducing a whole new level of complexity of care in a prolonged field care environment and risk. You know, intubating a, in, intubating a patient, you know, it is risky in an OR under controlled settings. And it's, you know, risky to the point of, you know, really need to decide whether you you need to do this or avoid this in any other environment. Right. You know, I think in just with anything, it, it all leans to just pay attention to what you're doing, pay attention to the patient's response to it. You know, just like yeah. with burns, um, you know, like you said, the, the people believe that because I, I arrived at this number with a formula, I'm going to mm-hmm. trust that versus trust um, my education, my training, you know, what I, what I've, C, I guess, um, because I can put the blame back on the formula, right? Um, And, you know, if you just pay attention to the patient, I think you would be able to guide this, uh, this fluid a lot, a lot better. Um, I mean, in, in general, in critical care, critically ill and injured patients who are in shock, I see bad outcomes from one of two things, either late recognition and initiation of decisive action or over adherence to a formula and, and, um, for, and, uh, protocolized medicine, um, without accounting for, um, you know, clinical response and assessment and judgment about the patient. Mm-hmm. Both of those two things will far more guarantee you a bad outcome than, you know, recognize early and treat the patient. Right. Um, so I think that's good with the fluids. Um, I guess your fluid of choice, is that the one you have or do you have an ideal? <laughs> the one you have in a prolonged field care environment, I mean, if you have a balanced electrolyte solution like Ringer's lactate or plasmolite, um, you know, that, that probably has some slight benefits. Um, but if all you have is normal saline or, or, or yeah, normal saline, then give them normal saline if you need it. Okay. Um, now mentioned earlier in the CPG, they talk about finding the patient's blood type. Um, no. Is there is there a colloids? I mean, do you ever use a colloid of any kind in a sepsis uh, patient, especially if you're giving lots of fluid? Yeah, just like in just like in burns, at a at a certain point, you know, if I'm giving them a ton of fluid, which again, we've kind of gotten away from. You know, the days of like the the days of the Double digit liter fluid resuscitation and sepsis are, are pretty much over. You know, we're going to give three, four, five. I, I can't even remember giving five liters recently, a bunch of fluid, and then we're going to start them on pressers. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, in something, you know, something like Ebola where you've got high output losses uh, and you're worried about compartment syndrome, then absolutely I'll switch to a colloid. Okay. And that could be. FFP, it could be albumin, it could be freeze dry plasma. Right. Um, which kind of leads me to this next question. So um, say we're giving we're giving fluids, we're giving a good oh. response. Go ahead. 
can I do a caveat or a, a, an alibi to that last answer? Sure. The one place I would give colleagues earlier is if I know my septic patient has heart, known heart, heart failure. You know, um, obviously that's probably not going to be anybody in our formation, but, you know, I just have had some correspondence um, with some soft elements overseas treating um, contractors uh, in their 60s and 70s for um, COVID. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, there's one of them, one of them definitely had um, heart failure, you know, ejection fraction in the, you know, 40% range. So okay. you definitely do not want to bomb them with a whole bunch of crystalloid. And I would switch to call it pretty um, early with them and really try to limit the fluid they got and go to pressors early. But that's a, that's a unique, that's a small subset. Yeah. Okay. Um, but again, speaking about fluids, so we're giving, say we're giving our patient fluids and we're giving, you know, good response. Um, you know, their mentation comes back up. Maybe their urine output picks up a little bit, maybe not exactly where we want it, but it's at least is increasing. Right. Um, but we have the, like the two thirds rule with, with crystalloids, you know, in an hour, mm-hmm. you know, roughly a third of it will be left, right. The other two thirds will, will third space or the urine output. Um, do you just continue just worse than fluids? that? Yeah. It can be as low as 10% is left intervascularly at, at an hour. Okay. After, after a crystalloid fluid bullet. So that kind of, anyway, most of, most of it's not in the blood vessels having any hemodynamic effect. Okay. So, Say we're giving some effect, okay? Um, mm-hmm. Is it okay to just continue fluids at, at, a, at a you know a slower rate, obviously, um, to try and maintain that, or should I just should that you know thirty mLs per kilogram? Once you've hit, regardless of how long it takes you, say twelve hours or eighteen hours, once you've hit that mark, okay, um, that's too much fluid. Because you know mm-hmm. it's third spacing, edema, et cetera, et cetera. Um, should you then switch to a presser, or if it's working, is there any real downside to just continuing? Yeah, and I'm kind of curious if I'm giving a crystalloid and he, he or she, the the patient is peeing, is that in any way giving me a false positive for resuscitation? Like, is urine output is where I want it to be? But it's just because it's the crystalloid, not because it's actually resuscitating him. No, I think you know if they're if you're giving them fluid and they're peeing, you're essentially meeting one of your resuscitation goals. And then you should be asking yourself, do I need to, you know, a give less resuscitation or b give no resuscitation and see how they go? Okay. Because this is where this is where people get into trouble. They're like, oh, you know, I'm giving them crystalloid, and they're peeing, and they don't change anything, and they keep getting crystalloid, and they keep peeing, but now they're at higher risk of having complications, whether that's you know respiratory failure from pulmonary edema or or compartment syndrome. Right. Um, and at a certain point, you know, too much resuscitation will damage the kidneys as well. Uh, as well, right? I mean, if you're third spacing from your renal capillaries. Um, and don't forget the kidneys are, are, are an encapsulated organ, right? There's a really thick, tough um, covering around the kidneys. They, they can't expand indefinitely. I mean, it's not as bad as the brain and the skull, but, you know, they're not infinitely distensible. When you over-resuscitate the kidneys, they third space enough into that, you know, minimally distensible cap- capsule, and then you start having, you know, compartments and, you know, renal compartments in and then your and then your urine output goes off, and you're like, "Oh, I'm giving fluids now. Your urine output goes off. Goes off. So, what's your natural inclination? No I'm one. giving fluids, right? I'm going to give them more, which is exactly right. what they don't need, right? So, it's just, just like with response. burns, yeah, just like with burns. I mean, giving more fluid is way more easier, is way easier than turning fluids down, even though all your markers are saying he's had enough. Yeah, yeah. There's something in critical injury and illness psychology that, that, that is called creep, right? There's fluid creep, there's analgesia creep, there's sedation creep. And we, we always give our patients more and, and we rarely, and we rarely give them less. And when, when less is usually what they need. So it's just something to be aware of and guard against. So, you know, Justin, in response to your patient, 
they're peeing, I'm giving them crystalloids, you know, cut the crystalloids in half or, or you know, be, be bold and cut them off altogether and see if they keep peeing. All right. I like it. Do you, um, do you go down the same road as with burns with resuscitation, even though you know they need ongoing resuscitation? Are we reducing drip rates by 20 percent, increasing them by 20 percent? Is that a fair, quantifiable thing to do? You know, there's no real hard and fast rule. I said to pick a number, you know, go down by something, right? So um, go down. I'll, yeah. pick, I'll pick a number. <laughs> <laughs> Just go down by something, honestly, um, and, and see. And if and if you go down by something, let's say you're, you're cautious and you pick 20%, right? Let's say you're in 100 an hour and you go down to 80 an hour. Um, and then they're still pe- peeing. Well, then, you know, if you still want to be cautious, go down more, go down to 60. Eventually, you know, if they're responders, you'll probably either be able to come off or give them maintenance. Um, and again, the only reason to give them maintenance is that they can't take maintenance oral fluids um, or take them off altogether and let them eat and drink and encourage, encourage hydrate, oral hydration. Or okay. if you're bold, you know, go down by 50% and then go down by 50% again and then turn it off, you know. Okay. Now, how long do you wait? Do you wait an hour? Before you remeasure, I do two hours. You know, I think the, the fevers and kidneys, I think, are something I would assess over a couple of hours, unless unless there's something really acute. You know, if if you wait an hour for a fever and it jumps from you know 100.5 to 105, well, then obviously I'm not going to wait for the second hour. Right. But if, you know, if it's 100.5 for an hour or seven for an hour and it's 100.5, you know, I'm probably not going to jump on doing anything about it. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Same thing with urine output. Give, it, give the organ a, a little bit of a t- chance to adjust. And if it's, you know, I, it's in general, I'd say, you know, two hours is probably a better time frame. Okay. Um, Even if they're aneuric, you know, if they're aneuric, um, it goes both ways. If they're not making any urine at all and you've got, you know, a reasonable fluid strategy, give it time to work. And if it's not working after, you know, a decent amount of time, two hours, you know, then readdress it. And then, you know, then you've got to ask yourself probably some of the questions we'll get into in the next podcast, is it not working because my fluid strategy is bad? Uh, not bad, but you know, my fluid strategy needs revision, or is it not working because they have some sort of a renal injury that's not going to respond to fluid? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but that's another podcast. So um, that's another podcast. <laughs> um, now, our decision to go to vasopressors. So, our, when you you're first giving your fluids, right? Uh, maybe you're one bolus, two bolus, whatever, whatever you feel comfortable with. Okay. You've picked a number and you've gone with it. You're not getting mm-hmm. any joy out of it. Um, now you, now you decide to go to a vasopressor. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of the drug is choice is, right. How about this? Actually, what tells you um, with that fluid bolus, I'm not getting what I want out of it. So I'm not really like, how do you quantify his mental status didn't go up enough, right? It probably would change right. a little bit, but where do you draw the line of this is enough, this is not enough? I think any positive change is good. Um, keep going with your strategy. If you're seeing positive changes, I would say no change. They're still confused. They're still abundant. They're still not following command. Okay. Uh, and, and their systolic blood pressure is still less than 90. I'll, I'll use systolic. I use MAP, but that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but the systolic blood pressure is still less than 90. Okay. So um, can, I, can I be a jerk and ask you, um, after how long and how much fluid, uh, if I've given them a bunch of fluid and X number of hours have passed, when am I going to make the decision to pull the trigger on a vasopressor without improved blood pressure? Uh, I would probably do it, you know, lick my thumb, put it in the air, feel, feel the breeze. Uh, as I'm giving this answer, you know, a couple liters of fluid over a couple hours. Okay. And this, this is all predisposed. This is all predicated on, I do not have an unpatient, a, a super unstable patient who's like threatening to die on me, right? A patient, you know, a, a GCS of three, blood pressure of 50 over 30 or 60 over 40. You know, th- this is like less, you know, sick but not unstable. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. So they're sick or not sick. They're stable and it's unstable. And then they're trends better, same or worse. So sick, unstable patient, you know, you're going to probably hit them with fluid. You're going to hit them with a presser and you're going to try to get, you know, a blood pressure that's acceptable and, and hopefully the mental status will follow, but at least, you know, you've got a blood pressure that's compatible with life. Okay. You know, so they're at, they're out of it. I've given them a substantial amount of fluid, like a couple of liters, no change. Right. Then maybe I'm going to drop some, some pressors. And again, your pressors are really for blood pressure, right? Yeah. Pressors are not for pressors. Pressors are only for blood pressure and a little bit of cardiac output, which, which definitely governs blood pressure. You're not giving pressors in a normal tensive patient. And by a normal tensive patient, I mean a patient with a, you know, um, a systolic blood pressure of 90 or above or a mean arterial pressure of 65 or above. And a lot of times we'll even, you know, feed on that a little bit or, or shade that a little bit and be like, wow, you know, let's let, let's let them get down to 60 and see if, if we need to get impressors. If they keep falling to 60, I'm like, okay, I probably need to turn something on. So it's, but that's an important point is that you only give pressors for hypotension. Not, it's not for, you don't, you don't give them in a normal tensive patient to make the urine output get better. You don't give them in a normal tensive patient to get the, um, mental status better. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah. Makes and sense. by normal tensive, I mean low normal blood pressure. You know, a, a mean arterial pressure is 65, which can be, you know, it can, you can have blood pressure of like 80 over 30 and have a mean arterial pressure of 65, I think. You know, I'm not doing the calculations in real time, but you'd be amazed at how low a systolic blood pressure you can have and still have an adequate mean arterial pressure, which is what the brain is seeing in terms of perfusion pressure, mm -hmm. which is kind of what we go by. Okay. But I mean, by oh. fixing that blood pressure, fixing that number, you're fixing the, hopefully you're fixing the perfusion, which then fixes the other problems. Is that right. correct? But that number has got to be, the number one has to be hypotensive and new, and two needs to be pretty bloody hypotensive for you to need pressure, which, you know, you can be, I mean, you can have, you know, systolics in the 70s, systolics in the 80s, then sepsis and septic shock. Um, and you're really in septic shock here. You're not just in sepsis um, when we're talking about using pressors. And then, yeah, you absolutely need to start a presser. Right. And your fluid is either going to bring it bring it up or it's not. Sorry, Justin, go ahead. What, no, I'm sorry. One of the things I'm curious about is what can I expect to see in a patient if I do push epi? Because I know... Epi versus nor epi is going to have some respiratory effects, obviously some cardiac effects, uh, and they're going to be a little bit different. But if I'm pushing epi instead of nor epi, because that's what I have, uh, what do I expect to see happen in my patient if I get a good response? Let's just call it a good response. Like, what are the side probably, effects? And probably not a lot different. Um, I, I uh, honestly, um, the the negative side effects of epi that you might see are some um, tachycardic arrhythmias. Um, so, you know, SVT, su um, supraventricular tachycardia, maybe some PVCs. Um, so it, it's a, it, oh, good. It, it tends to be associated with a little bit more rhythm instability than norepinephrine, but not nearly as much as dobutamine or, or even dopamine in high doses. So it, but you may see that. Um, and then the second thing is if, if, you know, like I said, you do have your, you know, your fancy TFC seal of approval field lact lactometer, um, you can actually see lactic acid, acid rise in, in response to epinephrine. But again, you're probably not going to have that. Yeah. So we tachyarrhythmia would be the number well one. As something to be aware of if we're pushing FB as our vasopressor that it's going to affect your, uh, potentially affect your lactate levels. Yeah. Yeah. So, but again, you have to balance the side effects versus, you know, the side effects of having a blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of 50 are, you know, you know, pretty severe. Um, you know, and so a lower dose given as a drip rather than a push, all of those are associated with a little bit less um, uh, rhythm instability. Uh, giving calcium in addition to epi, 
can calm down um, the risk of, of instability. Um, sometimes even giving bar carb as well, but calcium for sure. Um, you know, and in most of our unstable cardiac patients, we're giving impressor and calcium. Okay. Is that just because of the, you're kind of replenishing, replenishing that calcium because it's been like hypo, hypo perfused. The heart has been hypo perfused or is there another reason? Partially because, um, they've been on cardiac bypass. Uh, but also, um, also it, um, it reduces, um, tech, you know, it, it stabilizes the electrical conduction system of the heart mm-hmm. and, um, and can get you and can help get you out of an unstable rhythm. Um, and into a more stable rhythm. And so if you've got, and you can be in an unstable rhythm for all sorts of reasons, you know, from inflammation and sepsis and toxins and hypo and hypoperfusion, you know, the, the list is long. Um, so, and, so if you give them epinephrine and they go into a, you know, less stable rhythm or, or a more tachycardia, sometimes you can, you can mitigate that with some calcium. Okay. Would you give that prophylactically? No, I would give the epinephrine and see if I need it. Okay. All right, good. Um, so really the only, I guess, the other main pillar that we haven't gone over yet, um, we've gone over early recognition, um, you know, identify where the source is through, through our assessments. Um, we've, done, we've gone over fluid resuscitation, so we've prevented them or hopefully prevented them from dying. Now we have to actually get control of the source itself. Um, that can be through antibiotics, that can be through wound management or just removing that offending source. Um, I guess quick on antibiotics, uh, is there, or anti-parasitics, I, obviously it can be more than just a bacterial infection. Um, I've heard guys talking about uh, ertapenem in that it's really falling out of the favor because of you know increasing infections downstream. Okay, roll four or roll three, roll four, et cetera. Um, so they're kind of um, leery, I guess, of using ertapenem in ver- versus uh, ANSEF or, or something like that. Um, as an ICU doc, what do, you, what do you think about that, doc? Should I just go with the big gun right away and try and uh, get control, or should I be more selective? Um, I'd be curious to see what kind of guys are concerned about this. I have my... Yeah. I guess, um, what do you mean? Guys, as far as well, unit like, or? No, no, no. It's like, you know, who's, who's voicing these concerns? Because, you know, we've been kind of in prolonged field care saying, um, ergopenem is, you know, pretty much our drug of choice for mm-hmm. critically ill, unstable patients. Um, because it's easy to dose. It covers a broad variety of things. Um, and has, you know, pretty minimal side effects. Yeah. It's also easy to administer for a medic right. in the field. It's not a hard drug to administer. And if you screw it up, the side effects are, yeah, like you said, they're, they're pretty minimal. Uh-huh. Right. Right. You know, I, I go, I sort of fall on, on the side of, you know, one of my trauma surgeon friends who said, you know, that there are far greater insults to the cause of antibiotic resistance than giving a few doses of ertapenem in an urgent prolonged field care austere situation. Right. Right. Nice. It's only going to be a problem if he lives long enough. So uh, give him, give him the antibiotic and then we can kind of suss things out uh, later on, I think. Well, it's actually only going to be a problem if we give it to so many people that the bacteria then is able to select um, for resistance to that antibiotic as a survival tool. And that's not going to happen with, you know, double digit, even triple digit, you know, you know, we're seeing mutations in the coronavirus because billion, you know, hundreds of or tens of millions of people have the, have the disease, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you're going to see antibiotic resistance minimum in the, in the tens to hundreds of thousands of, of people who get an antibiotic. So like I said, like, like she said, you know, far greater things have been done, you know, um, uh, in the cause of antibiotic resistance than giving a few doses of ertapenem in an austere emergency situation. So I wouldn't get, I wouldn't be too worried about it. Okay. Hey, just out of curiosity, sir, what do you guys give in a hospital? Like if you had, 
look, which you do have all the antibiotics in the world. What do you guys typically go to to treat sepsis? Sure, that's a great question. Um, our go to empiric coverage in a hospital is going to be um, an antibiotic number one that cover resistant organisms, right? Because we're in a hospital and, and that definitely breeds resistance. You know, we give so many antibiotics and, and the bacteria are in a relatively confined environment, right? Our hospital or somebody else's hospital that, that there's, there's, there's heavy pressure for, res, for resistance. So MRSA and um, Pseudomonas are the big two. And so um, we will give um, some sort of a gram positive agent against MRSA, um, the most common of which is vancomycin. And then we'll do either one or two um, gram negative agents against Pseudomonas, which isn't some um, against Pseudomonas. And um, there's evidence for both. We tend in our hospital to give only one uh, and then see how they do. And if they get sicker, add a second. And so that could be um, Zosin, which is Piperacillin Tazobactam. That's a, that's a anti-pseudomonal penicillin. Uh, it could be stefapine, which is a fourth generation um, for quinolone. Those are probably the big two. Uh, or, or it could be um, meropenem or imipenem. Um, the important thing about um, ertapenem is it does not cover pseudomonas. So even though it has penem at the end, just like the carbapenem, it's the one thing it doesn't cover is pseudomonas, which is why you won't see us give it in the hospital very much. So outside of just giving antibiotics, uh, especially if you're talking about um, you know war wounds or breaks in the skin, uh, you're going to have to do some kind of wound management. So that's another reason why I asked you to come on, uh, Justin, because you helped with the wound management CPG. Um, I guess how are you, how are you approaching? I guess wound management um, because generally, you know we. In the field, uh, you know, we work real quick to, to cover up cover up the injury, um, and we may not be so uh, quick to uh, do a good uh, irrigation or, uh, you know, even a real sloppy debridement. Um, so I guess when when are you going back and and actually focusing on wound management? Yeah, when I was looking up research about this and talking to people about uh, sepsis and its prevention, which is what wound management is for me, is it's not necessarily managing the wound like we talked about with urine output. There's a, there's a goal to it, and the goal is always infection prevention, I think, for me anyways. Uh, but one of the things that most people said to me was good debridement. Irrigation is extremely important. It's a pretty rudimentary skill. I, I don't want to say that as if it's a cavalier task, like you should still probably be judicious about it. But ineffective debridement is uh, one of the biggest causes of sepsis uh, for war wounds. I, I, I don't know, Doug, do you got any input on that? that? That's pretty much what I've seen or read. No, I, I agree 100%. You know, um, if there's if there's devitalized tissue there, uh, you can irrigate it all day long, um, but it's still going to be a source of infection for when the water goes away. Um, and that, you know, the, probably the most important thing, which I'm sure you wrote about in the CPG is, you know, look at the wounds every day, you know, don't let them hide under a bandage and at a minimum every day and ideally, you know, twice a day. Um, and, uh, you know, early on, it's probably like the biggest risk of, of, um, tissue devitalization is going to occur because the, the area of hypoxia that causes the devitalized tissue is sort of evolving um, in the first few days. And so that's when you're probably going to see um, the highest risk of, of um, non-viable tissue and, and infection risk if it's not debrided. Yeah. Um, and one of the, one of the uh, other things to think about is that biofilm that's going to start covering that wound after a day or so. Um, you have to you have to scrape all that off, okay? So not only just the, the devitalized tissue, but any kind of the biofilm that's going to cover that, it can start covering like urinary catheters, it can start covering uh, ET tubes, crikes, things like that. But after a day or so, 
this film, that bacteria is going to create this film. And if you don't get it off, uh, your antibiotics are not going to penetrate through that. That's the bacteria is creating that to protect itself. So you have to actually debride that off in order for your antibiotics to, to actually be effective at all. Uh, do you guys have anything you'd like to add that uh, we didn't cover about sepsis or the CPG? I guess the only thing I would add is in terms of source identification, most of the literature that I read, regardless of what is causing it, whether it's a parasite, a bacteria, a fungus, you're always going to give antibiotics. Uh, and, if, and if Dr. Powell has some other input on that, I'd love to hear it. But that's pretty much what I read. You're always going to give antibiotics. And then the next step, if, is, if he's not getting better, he or she is not getting better, you have to ask yourself, well, if this could be on my differential or on my index of suspicion, i.e. malaria, for example, and I treat him for malaria and I'm wrong, am I hurting the patient? I, I, in an austere environment, that's a pretty important question. So if I treat him for malaria and, and that person doesn't have malaria, am I making them worse? In, in the case of malaria, probably not. So that's just one of those questions you have to ask yourself in terms of your differential. In terms of a fungal infection, that is absolutely a telemed question because, yes, you, you could be hurting them substantially. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Do you have any, you have any insight on that, Dr. Powell? Um, yeah, I mean, it's rare that you have a septic patient uh, in fact, I'd say it's probably rare to the point of you'll never see it where you have a septic patient and an infected patient and you don't start with antibiotics. So, you know, even in the hospital where, you know, we immediately have a GI infection, which can be fungal uh, or, or, you know, um, we're always, you know, the first 24 hours, really the first 48 to 72 hours, they're always going to be on broad spectrum antibiotics. So the purpose of this discussion you should have them on antibiotics, but you should also, you know, know what your endemic risk is. If you're in a malaria area, like you said, it's probably better, you know, to, and they're, and they're super sick. Um, it's probably better to assume that they have malaria and add an antimalarial and then take one or the other away when you have your diagnosis, right? You know, you do your malaria test and if it's positive, you can probably pull away the antibiotics. If it's negative, you probably need to keep the antibiotics and pull away the antimalarial. So, that's, that's the one obvious case I can think of in our, our operating environment. All right, outstanding. Um, is there any other uh, tidbits you have, Doug? No, gosh, uh, thanks for the chance to comment and uh, Justin, solid work on the, on the CPG. Those are, those are never easy. It's a lot of cat herding, and I think you did an exemplary job, so it's great to see it out in, uh, in the community for a reference. Hey, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, yeah, I just want to say what a privilege it was to be the team lead on, on another CPG to be asked to do that. Uh, it was a real honor. And it was especially an honor to get to be mentored and work on a project like this with uh, Dr. Keenan, Dr. Shackelford, Dr. Mays. These were the people I had the most contact with. And most definitely Mike Sertoni, who is a fellow peer of mine, but most definitely a mentor. And and somebody that I would very much like to take the opportunity to mention and thank, and that's my wife, Andrea, who I don't think I really truly realized was a mentor until I looked back on the development of this CPG. She's a nurse in the 12th busiest emergency department in the country. She works very hard. She's a very compassionate nurse. And I learned a lot about sepsis from her. And it was kind of unbeknownst to me because it was very much conversation because we're medical personnel, so it doesn't gross us out at the dinner table, but they're very much conversations around the dinner table and in the evening about the patients that she treated. And so I learned a whole lot to her and, and very much of that wove its way into almost every element of the CPG. A lot of the information was something that I had to chase down, but I didn't realize what a mentor my wife was to me. So thank you very much, honey. I love you. That's it for today's podcast. Make sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Check out our free downloads and a ton of other helpful information. Grab a bag of our fresh roasted PFC coffee, links in the description below, and stay on the bleeding edge of combat and austere medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast, out. Out.